guys, welcome back to Hike Oregon and thank you so much for watching the part three of the Hiking in Winter series. Today we are going to talk all about snowshoes. research on snowshoes, I found that there are many different types and sizes and certain things to think about when snowshoe shopping. You can't just really go to a store and just pick up a pair of snowshoes. It probably won't work well for you. And snowshoes are very expensive, so you should definitely do your research and figure out what type of snowshoes would work best for you. There are three main types of snowshoes. Snowshoes for flat terrain, snowshoes for rolling mid-range terrain, and then snowshoes that are mainly used for mountaineering and that kind of thing. The flat terrain snowshoes are, like in the name, flat terrain, not much elevation gain, you're just kind of trudging through the snow, taking in the scenery, that kind of thing. Rolling terrain is probably what most hikers would want to go for. That's going to be your you know, 500 feet elevation gain for a small like six mile hike. Just where you're going up and down, but you're not like scaling a, a hill or a, an icy mountain. Of course, the mountain terrain snowshoes would be for anything with significant elevation gain. Also, icy terrain, you're gonna want those mountaineering snowshoes. Next thing you want to think about is sizing. There are two main types, aluminum frame snowshoes and composite snowshoes. So the aluminum frame snowshoes are the more popular ones, the ones that you see in stores, you know, Costco sells snowshoes that are very popular because they're pretty good price. Um, those are going to be the aluminum frame snowshoes. And I wrote it down here, they do come in multiple sizes, generally 8 by 25 inches, 9 by 30 inches, and 10 by 36 inches. The composite snowshoes typically only come in one size, and that's 8 by 22 inches. The thing with the composite snowshoes are you can do add-ons that add on the tail, so it does make them longer in the end when you have those add-ons. The composite snowshoes are more used for like the soft snow, and the tail kind of helps you stay afloat. When you're trying to find the size snowshoe that you think would work best for you, there's some certain things to keep in mind. You could just size by the load. This would be your easiest way to size the snowshoe. You basically just think about how heavy you are and how heavy your pack is. So let's say just going for a day hike snowshoe trip, you know, you're gonna have 15 pounds or less, and then your weight. So the way to get your size, your recommended size, would be to just go to the MSR website or the REI website or whatever brand of snowshoe that you're thinking of buying and then look at the specs. So if you're interested in a certain type of snowshoe, let's say flat terrain, aluminum frame, you got that figured out and then you just look at the specs and the specs will tell you what load the snowshoe can carry it'll say maximum load. That would be a really easy way to just get a simple pair of snowshoes. If you want to get a little more technical with it, you definitely can. And that means sizing by snow conditions. So for example, if you live in Bend, Oregon, and you know you have very dry powder very fluffy snow, you're definitely going to want a wider and bigger snowshoe that will keep you afloat on the fluffy snow. If you're hiking in more wet, icy conditions uh, where the snow is not so lofty, then you're going to go with a smaller, more narrow snowshoe with a more aggressive tread. And I'll talk about the tread here in a second. Again, keep in mind the specs whenever you're buying the snowshoe. Make sure that it can hold your weight as well as the weight of whatever pack you're carrying. That's really important. Next, we'll talk about the snowshoe frame and the decking. So if you don't know what I'm talking about here, I have a snowshoe right here. So the frame is obviously this part. The decking is this colorful part, the blue and the red. 
So mine is made out of this part. The red part's plastic. The blue part feels like some sort of rubber material. So that's what I'm talking about here. So most snowshoes, like I said before, are an aluminum frame and it'll have some sort of synthetic decking. The decking is usually made out of some sort of nylon or hypalon material and that keeps the snowshoe really lightweight so it can float on top of the snow. So the composite snowshoe that I was talking about earlier, that is not an aluminum frame, it's the composite frame and those generally have some sort of integrated hard decking and those aren't as lightweight but then again you can add that tail to the end which helps with flotation. Snowshoe bindings, that's also something to think about and will vary again depending on the type of terrain that you're going into. So there's rotating or floating bindings and then there's fixed bindings. So the rotating bindings have like a pivot point, it's like under the balls of the feet so I'll show you right here. So it'll pivot. So mine are actually not floating. Mine are fixed bindings. So the fixed binding you can see is just attached by the decking um, and it doesn't actually rotate that much. Um, so this is a fixed binding. The floating binding or the rotating binding is more like a pivot point. There's more movement and it allows you to climb more naturally up hills. That's one of the good things about the rotating binding. Having the rotating binding allows the snowshoe to kind of pivot more as you pick up your feet and it allows the snow to fall off the end more easily than on a fixed binding like this, which makes the snowshoe lighter because the snow doesn't collect on your snowshoe and can reduce fatigue in your legs and stuff when going. So that's something to think about. I think I would definitely go with a rotating binding uh, rather than a fixed binding. Again, the fixed binding is connected by a heavy duty rubber or uh, neoprene, which like I said is this. The pro with something like this is that it doesn't allow the snowshoe to fall as much when you pick up your foot, like it kind of just stops there. And this makes it easier to maneuver over down logs or stuff you might have to step over on the trail uh, because you don't have, you know, this going all the way down. So that's something to think about if you're going on trails that aren't groomed, um, you may want a fixed binding. Next we'll talk about the various traction devices that go on the bottom of the snowshoe. So all snowshoes come with some sort of teeth at the bottom. You'll see that here. So I have teeth on the pivot point and then two sets of teeth here towards the end. Toe or instep crampons is on the underside of the binding, which that's this right here. And it allows you to dig in and really climb if that's what you need. So if you're getting a mountaineering snowshoe, obviously these are going to be way more aggressive. So they'll be longer, uh, more teeth, uh, longer teeth, that kind of thing. So the heel crampons, those are these, generally shaped in a v-shaped form. They're nice to have especially when you're going downhill so that you don't slip especially in icy conditions. This is generally the setup you'll see on most snowshoes unless you're going really specific. Then you'll see stuff like side rails which provides lateral stability. So um, if you're crossing really steep slopes on like a side slope you'll you'll want those but again unless you're mountaineering or doing really backcountry stuff, you're not going to need that. Same with the braking bars, those would be somewhere right here and it's like if you're going down really steep, again if you're mountaineering you'll, you would want those so that you don't slide. And then the heel lifts, also known as climbing bars, they kind of make the underside of, or the backside of the snowshoe higher so that when you're climbing you're not putting so much strain on your calf. Again, those three things are really just for if you're mountaineering. And if you're mountaineering and you know nothing about snowshoes, you probably should take a step back and just go for a simple three mile snowshoe trip, see if you still like it. And last but not least, just wanted to quickly talk about footwear. I know that was in the first hiking in winter video. Again, if you are snowshoeing, you want certain footwear. 
you're going to want a waterproof boot, preferably insulated. You're going to want really warm socks and the boot should have a pretty aggressive uh, rubber sole so that it fits well into the snowshoe binding and it's not too flimsy, that kind of thing. Those are really the fundamentals of the snowshoes, things you wanna look out for. Again, I think it's really important to know what kind of terrain you're going to be snowshoeing in. And then again, just keep in mind the weight specs for the snowshoe. I think those are if anything, the two most important things to look at. The rest, I think, is just, I mean, if you want to get really specific into snowshoeing. So, um, I just wanted to quickly show you mine. Mine are Tubbs snowshoes, so they're made in the USA. So I'll just show you these up close here. So they have these bindings. I'm not too crazy about these bindings because they don't have clips. So you kind of got to maneuver this by hand and tighten it by hand, which can be annoying if your hand is frozen. Also, these straps get frozen if they get covered in snow. Sometimes these can be really frozen because these are just like a nylon material. So yeah, keep that in mind. If you see something with maybe a plastic strap, that might be better. And then here is the back. So. Again, this is not a very aggressive snowshoe, I will say that, um, but I haven't really ever been in a situation where I've slipped or anything like that. I generally am doing the rolling terrain type of snowshoeing, so I'm not going up steep icy slopes. Otherwise, this would not be aggressive enough. Another thing with something like this, as you can see, it kind of forms a box and what I've found is that snow gets clumped in here and when snow and ice gets clumped in here it's really hard to get that out. So if you find a snowshoe that maybe has more points and more teeth that will keep the snow from clumping into one place. And again, these little points, it's not a lot but it's something. Yeah, basically that's what these look like. Another thing I'd like to mention if you are going snowshoeing is snow parks. So here in Oregon, we have tons and tons of snow parks. Now, the cool thing about snow parks, rather than just going on a hiking trail and using your snowshoes, is that the snow parks have designated trails for snow, meaning that all of the trail markers are located really high up on the tree so that even when there's six, ten feet of snow, you can still see the trail and the trail markers. So all of the maps are really high up, all of the blue diamond blazes, they're all high on the tree. So the trails are really well marked. If okay. you are just going on a hiking trail, keep in mind that you will probably not see trail markers and likely the signs for trail junctions and stuff will be covered with snow as well. If you want to be safe and you're pretty new to snowshoeing, I would stick to snow parks where you can see the trail. Another cool thing is that at a lot of snow parks, especially the ones near ski resorts, they are maintained. So all of the tracks and stuff are maintained, which makes snowshoeing so much easier if you don't have to blaze your own trail. If you're blazing your own trail, it takes like triple the amount of energy and you'll go three miles and be tired. So it is so helpful to have a nice trail already blazed in front of you and you can just enjoy the hike. Another awesome thing about snow parks is that they plow the parking lot. So again, if you're just going to a random hiking trail that you would like to snowshoe, you'll run into that the parking lot is also full of snow. So unless you have a car that is fine for going into, you know, three, four feet of snow, like a Jeep or something, you probably won't even make it to the trailhead. So that is another awesome thing about snow parks is that you can just drive right in to the trailhead and get geared up and go. Although if you are going to a snow park, keep in mind that you do have to pay. Your Northwest Forest Pass does not cover snow parks. It says on the back. So you can buy an annual snow park pass and a snow park pass is required at snow parks from November 1st through April 30th. And an annual pass costs $25. Uh, so if you're, you know, going multiple times during the winter and spring, 
that is definitely something to invest in. If not, you can buy a day snow park pass for just $5. And you can get that at your local ranger station and at REI. Thank you so much for watching this Hiking in Winter series. I hope you enjoyed. If there are any other questions you have about hiking or recreating in the winter, let me know and I could possibly do a part four if there is interest. So let me know in the comments below. If not, I hope you have a very happy holiday and I will catch you on the next adventure.